I'd like to summarise everything that I've been saying so far. And it's possible to summarise everything in, in a really short and simple way. So it's good to come back to that. And the basic gist of what I've been saying is that our understanding of mental health stroke, the mental health conditions, is all over the place. It's very, very poor and not at all helpful. Shockingly, um, shockingly pointless, really. It's a mess. And so that's one point, that our way of understanding mental health conditions is pretty lame. And the second point is there's a reason for this. And the reason, it's not that we're struggling to gain knowledge bit by bit and that we're gradually getting there. So we could say, OK, it's the, um, it's the last great unknown inner space, the inside of us. We don't have all the answers yet. This is what we could say. We don't have all the answers yet. We're still working in the dark, but we're getting there. We're making progress. So we could say that. It's possible to say that, which kind of justifies our ignorance. But it's not like that. We're not slowly making progress and gradually accumulating um, gems of wisdom. Far from it, we're going in, in entirely the wrong direction. And we're being very arrogant about it. Very, um, very proud of ourselves in as much as we won't, we, we're incapable of hearing that we've actually got it totally wrong, which is not a nice, not an easy thing to hear anyway. It's never easy to receive the message that one has got it totally all wrong. That's the back to the drawing board scenario. We've invested so much, we've allowed ourselves to hope that we're getting somewhere, etc., etc., and then we find, bang, that's all just um, fantasy. And actually, we haven't got anywhere, we know nothing. So obviously, that's not um, something we want to hear. But we do need to be open to hearing it with the acknowledgement that it's not easy to hear, but we should be open to hearing it really. Otherwise, what does that say about us? And that's a rhetorical question because of course, it's, it's easy to see what they, that says about us. So there's a reason for our um, uh, our chronic lack of understanding and insight into, into, into what's going on psychology wise. And that reason is essentially that we are playing a type of a game. We're not admitting that we're playing it, but we're playing it, we're playing this game. And in order to play the game, just as in the case of playing any game, we have to look at things a specific way and we can't um, be open to information. This is what James Cast calls self-failing. And he says we have to veil our freedom from ourselves in order to play a game. So we've got this freedom, which is essentially the freedom to not have to play the game. And we veil that freedom from ourselves. So it's like we do have to play the game. There's no option. But clearly, if I knew I didn't have to play the game, I could walk off set any time and it wouldn't be the same experience at all. It would be a very provisional type of a game. It wouldn't be a game. Games only work when the possibility of questioning what we're doing is completely gone because then we really are thrown into just having to do it and do it the right way rather than the wrong way. The third possibility, which is, well, what the hell am I 
taken all this so seriously for anyway doesn't come into it because this particular type of awareness which says what the hell am I taking this so seriously for anyway is a game killer we take our game seriously you have to and we manage this by screening out the information that lets us know that actually it's not serious at all really it's just a game So this brings us to the question of what is the what is the game that we are playing then? What is it? And we can answer it by saying that this isn't entirely obvious because we we're already playing the game, so we're already screening out all information that relates to <coughs> stuff that would tend to falsify the game so we're already locked into a single way of seeing things so to, in order to understand why the game is a game and what the game is we'd have to somehow step out of the game but that is always possible we can always step out of the game reflect upon the game so we can say the game is that we're playing at being this thing which is the hermetically sealed ego construct. So it's sealed, it's totally sealed, which means that there is a vast gulf between what's on the inside of the seal or the membrane, which is me, and what lies on the outside. There is no, um, there is no um, sameness between what's me and what is outside of the membrane of me otherwise the whole game of me wouldn't wouldn't be um wouldn't exist we couldn't play it now this may not sound like a game being a self being a me doesn't sound like a game because we don't know any other way it seems like it sounds like um it's a given it's so obvious people would laugh at you in the street if you started remarking on it because it's so obvious that we never ever think about it we never need to think about it because it's so obvious which means which simply means that um we're not open to questioning really it doesn't mean it's true it's seems to us to be perfectly reasonable to believe in a hermetically sealed self-construct as if that is um, a regular part of life and that's how life um, does it that's how life appears in these little parcels or packages and that's how it's supposed to do it and etc etc but we don't have to investigate too much to see something suspicious about this the whole business of separating things out so that this is me definitely me that's all me and on the other side of the barrier that is not me nothing absolutely nothing to do with me that disconnect that disconnection and as soon as we say that it doesn't sound too good because the mental health terms disconnection isn't good it doesn't sound good and um because we know that the feeling of being disconnected from a greater the greater whole or from other people or from the world feels really really bad we know that we all know that we try to comp compensate for that feeling of being isolated or disconnected by joining groups so that we can get the feeling of belonging in a group which covers up that bad feeling a bit but only temporarily and only in a superficial kind of a way because even though there is this surface level belonging and acceptance that goes on in a group it's got nothing to do with who we really are only with who we pretend to be or who we're playing to be so it's kind of togetherness on the basis of who we're pretending to be and that's the best we can do 
to offset or to um, um, compensate for the painful disconnection that we are experiencing as a result of um, identifying totally with the self construct. So even just from this, um, this little look at the potential um, mental health problems inherent in being the self-concept, we can see a really big one straight away, as simple as that. And not only that, we can see why being a hermetically sealed self-construct, eco-construct, creates mental ill health. We can see that. We can also see how there is no fixing it. Because in order to fix it, we'd have to let go of the self-construct. We'd have to stop taking that boundary so seriously. We'd have to stop playing the game. But the whole point of the game is, the prime directive of the game is, you shall not stop playing the game, which is kind of linked with the directive, which is not overt but covert. You shall not know that the game is a game. So you mustn't stop playing the game, and you mustn't know that the game you're playing is a game. We think when we're playing a game that the rule is you have to win and not lose, and that's a kind of a rule. But that's only a red herring, that's only a, a thing to distract us. Actually, the bottom line is it doesn't matter at all whether we're losing in a really big way, if we're the biggest loser in town or whether we're the biggest winner in town. The game itself doesn't care because whether I'm being, whether I find myself in the position of being the winner or the position of being the loser doesn't, neither of those falsify the um, sense that I have. Then neither of them threaten the integrity of the game that's being played. Loser is good because that's part and parcel of the game. It has to have the possibility of being a loser in it. Winning is good because that's also part of it. So it doesn't matter at all. What really does matter is that we shall carry on playing the game. So what I'm coming to with that is that we can't get rid of the boundary. The boundary hurts us. It causes us a lot of pain, like a shoe that's three sizes too small and we've just walked 10 miles. It hurts. but we can't do anything about it because the prime directive is you, you, we have to keep on playing the game and we, which involves, which crucially involves not seeing that the game is a game, which means holding fast to the notion that the boundary is absolutely real and absolutely essential, which in turn, involves us believing that the boundary isn't in any way arbitrary or pointless or pathological or self um, frustrating or self-harming in any way. We can't see that. So straight away this makes it very easy to see how if we are playing this particular game we can't ever 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 let ourselves know what the root cause of our neurotic suffering is. It doesn't matter what we say it is or what theories we have about what it is. We can have any types of theories we want. As long as we, they, none of them bring us near to the truth. And that is so easy to see if we're playing the game then. The game is the source of our suffering. Games always make us suffer. We wouldn't play otherwise. In a game, there is a notion of achieving something or attaining something. And in order for that to be as attractive and as wonderful and as motivating as it is, we've got to be deficient of that thing that we're trying to achieve. If I'm not deficient in it, I'm not really going to kill myself trying to achieve it. So unconditioned reality, which is where we are playing the game, there isn't this deficit. 
there isn't this terrible hunger. But in the game, there is. In the game, there is no intrinsic well-being. There's no intrinsic wellness. No intrinsic mental health, we could say. So we're like a cat on a hot tin roof. We can't be comfortable where we are, but only in the striving. And what we're striving for is the, the remediation of our situation, the compensation for our situation. We, be, we know, not on a conscious level, that we're missing something. So we're always reaching out for it, we're always striving for it. So that is a fantastic source of motivation. And the thing is, no matter how many times we win or how big we win, it's not going to help us because winning doesn't really involve making good the inner deficit. It's a surrogate for that. It's something which represents that in a kind of um, deceptive or murky way. Now, obviously, winning can't really mean make, making good the inner deficit because as soon as the inner deficit is gotten rid of and I have that inner wellness, that's the game over because the whole game is trying to um, achieve that in some surrogate form. And the prime directive of the game is that you shall keep on playing the game, which means that the winning is never going to cure the hunger to win. And that's how games work. It's not about anything real, it's about keeping keeping the, the, the um, anticipation of something good happening, going, and we live in that anticipation. We have to because the anticipation is um, false, it's a deception, there is never going to be anything good really. Even though it feels good to win, it feels good to win because on an unconscious level we're equating that with the end of the deficit, but that's a lie because the deficit's still there and it'll show itself again soon after the moment of um, jubilation has passed. We realize we're as hungry as ever. Hunger makes the game. So if we are willing to um, contemplate this, this, this idea or entertain this idea that, we, that the hermetically sealed self-concept is a game, straight away this throws a whole new light on how we see the mental health conditions and what mental health is. Mental health is not playing the game. The thing is we aren't allowed to know that we're playing a game. We aren't allowed to know what mental health is either. So this just goes on and on and round and round and round and round. So before I finish, just to address one more point is, which is, well, why should the self-concept be a game? Why can't it just be the way that we are? And it's not that there's any logical ar argument to prove that, but we can illustrate way we can illustrate how that could be by looking at ways which of understanding the world that would tend to illustrate why there's no such thing as separated different essences of things, <clears throat> which is the way that the categorical mind works, of course. The categorical mind works in categories and cat categories involve separated essences of things, which is not a feature of um, the unmodified reality itself. That's the game. That's another way of looking at the game. So we can um, look at this and see it and quite clearly if we think about um, the holographic model of reality or the holographic model of the universe. It's not that we, we need to prove beyond any shadow of doubt that this is the right uh, definite, the true, um, how true things truly are because all statements like that are bizarre. But just that if we try it out as a way of looking at things, 
and it is a way of looking at things. It's a perfectly respectable way of looking at things. A lot of physicists would have a lot of time for the holographic theory. And the thing about the holographic theory is you can't separate things out in them because, as Anaxagoras said 3,000 years ago or a while ago, there's a little bit of everything in everything. So that's the holographic principle in a nutshell. Doesn't make much sense to us, but that's because we're used to understanding the world on the basis of the categorical mind, which doesn't show us reality as it actually is. That's just our bookkeeping. Our bookkeeping, our system of accountancy, is to pretend that everything exists in separate pots or compartments. That's just how the system works. It doesn't mean realities like that. According to the holographic um, model of reality, Everything's like a hologram, and in a hologram, every little bit of the hologram contains the information to um, generate the whole hologram. Every, every little bit has everything in it, nothing, which basically means this, just a way of saying there's no hard and fast boundaries that mean this is this, and that's always going to be separate from that because that's a totally different thing. So, if we if we look at things, look at the universe has been a hologram, which is the Anaxagorean universe, then we can say, well, it's never going to happen that we can have this self, this hermetically sealed um, ego construct. It can't happen because it isn't. It's the one thing that isn't possible in the holographic universe. It's the one thing that they can never be. Now, having said that, we can create the illusion that there is something special in this pot, in this category, that has to be preserved and kept and is different from everything else. We can play that illusion and we can identify with that, um, what Robert Anton Wilson calls an indwelling essence. So that's the idea that everything has an indwelling essence which is special to itself. The bunch of car keys that I've got there has a special indwelling essence of car keys. Obvious really, isn't it? The, the um, steering wheel has an indwelling essence of steering wheel. Again, perfectly obvious. Um, my t-shirt has an indwelling essence of t-shirt and, and so on and so forth. And that's what makes the phenomenal world is all these different indwelling essences that are all separate from each other. So that's the default way of understanding things. The non-holographic -holog way of understanding things. And we can understand ourselves like that. So we can understand ourselves as that there is this indwelling essence of self that is different from other essences. that has to be kept apart and protected from contamination, etc., etc., protected from being lost or damaged or destroyed. And we can identify with that so-called presumed, assumed indwelling essence of meanness. And that's what we all do, so it's possible to do that. But what we're doing when we do that is that we're identifying with something that isn't there and never could be there because we know that they can't, we know that this whole idea of indwelling essence is ludicrous. We know that um, our mental constructs are merely conventions. They don't stand for some deep aspect of reality. They really don't, we know that. So we identify with this, um, this illusion and we operate on the basis of it and we live on the basis of it. And that's just really, it's just another way of talking about the deficit that I was talking about earlier. The illusion is the deficit, the illusion of self, the indwelling essence of ego self is the illusion. So it's the deficit and it's the illusion. And the reason it's a deficit is because illusions are deficits. Illusions are deficient in reality. 